Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a king to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded said to one another, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, for mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. And now let us travel through the pages of eternity and make a homiletical stop in our hermeneutic connection to the Lord of God, as recorded in the Gospel of John. John chapter 12, verses 31 through 33, connect us here and says, Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. So pray with me on this bear's football playing Sunday. As we explore the subject, don't lose sight of your growth potential. Don't lose sight of your growth potential. This past Thursday, our vestry voted and approved a milestone on the journey toward the possibility of St. Thomas absorbing the Trinity Church and developing the property to its highest use, benefiting our church, the Diocese of Chicago, and our community at large. Our vestry voted to approve an agreement to engage our own TRC, or the Renaissance Collaborative, to consult with us as we move forward in this possibility. The primary objectives in this engagement are for TRC to provide the following assistance. Number one, visioning exercise to assist the St. Thomas Vestry with clarifying its values, mission, and goals, and align them with possible development strategies. Number two, preliminary assessment of the highest and best use of the site this will be based on legal permissibility, physical possibility, and a short financial analysis. Number three, seek the input of stakeholders, including the Alderwoman, Chicago Planning Department, CHA, IHDA state representatives, state senator, county commissioner, community organizations, etc. Number four, develop a preliminary master plan with options that align with the church's mission and goals and stakeholder input. The plan will provide a roadmap for developers to follow the direction of St. Thomas and the community. Number five, identify and recommend qualified development partners through an RFP process who can refine or amend the plan to meet market realities and then execute the plan. And number six, maintain contact with key stakeholders. Who would have ever imagined that we would now be in a position to absorb our sister church and create a development that will support the community and support our ministry to ensure that we grow and thrive for another 146 years and into perpetuity? Well, there is an answer to that question, and the answer is somebody imagined it. Yes, yes, come on. Somebody yes, yes. had a vision. Yes. Somebody had a vision for growth and development of our parish to the glory of God. Yes, yes. And likewise, beloved, I believe that God has a vision for each of our lives that is bigger than any vision we could possibly have for ourselves. Doesn't matter how old you are, how long you've been on this earth, what the 
points you have that keep you and our barriers to your success. God has given us, all of us, a vision for our lives that is bigger than visions we could ever possibly have for ourselves. To reach this vision, we are to grow for God's glory, not our own. To reach this vision, God desires us to grow spiritually and numerically as a church. God desires us to grow financially. Therefore, never lose sight of how big you can become or how much you can grow. Yes, yes. A healthy church never loses sight of how big it can become as a body of believers, as a community of faith, as the covenant people of God, as the redeemed. No matter what mistakes or setbacks it encounters along the way, no matter the delays or hardships, negative spirits or visionless people, it never loses sight of how big it can become for God's glory. We were not redeemed, I believe, for small things. Jesus did not shed his blood on Calvary for us to live mediocre lives that go around in circles making much ado about nothing. Yeah. Jesus yeah. redeemed us for big things. Jesus redeemed us to think great thoughts and to do big things for him, through him, and with him, and in his name. The tragedy is that many of us settle for so much less than what God desires for us. Some of us once had a glimpse of how big we could become or how far we could go in life, but somewhere along the way, we lost the vision. We became bogged down with mundane problems, or we became weighed down with mediocre people, and we lost the vision we once had of big things and faraway places. Or there were too many, there were so many obstacles and distractions that we gave up on the vision as fantasy rather than believing that the vision was something that could actually happen to us. Perhaps we gave up because the vision seemed too great and beyond our reach, or maybe it was so long in coming that we grew weary for reaching for it, or we allowed the temptations of the adversary and the weakness of the flesh to get in the way of the discipline and focus we yeah. needed to pursue the big things that the Lord showed us. I believe the Lord's message for us today, all of us, you and me, is to stay with your vision. Stay focused on the things that God has for your life. Never lose sight yes. of how big yes. you can become. Amen. Jesus never lost sight of how big he could become. This truth is evident, particularly in the text that I read today, the connecting text from the Gospel of John, when Jesus is talking about the cross. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Yes. You know, often we hear this text quoted. When we hear it quoted, we think of lifting up Jesus as an act of worship and praise. How often have we sung or heard it said that we have to lift Jesus up? But in the Gospels, those who lifted up Jesus were those who crucified him. They nailed Jesus to the cross and then lifted him up from the earth as he was fastened to the cross. When Jesus mentioned being lifted up from the earth in this text, he was referring to his death on the cross. That Jesus was talking about his crucifixion when he mentioned being lifted up from the earth is evident. It's evident from the surrounding verses. The context is not one of celebration, but of soberness. Jesus begins this by saying in earlier verses, Now my soul is troubled. And what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Yeah. The passage continues. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. 
Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. And then he says, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up yes. from the earth, yes. will draw all people to myself. I'm going somewhere. Yes, the next verse goes on to say, he said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. What is striking to me about this passage is not Jesus' prophecy concerning his death by crucifixion. Rather, it is the fact that even when he was talking about death by crucifixion, Jesus never lost sight of how big he could become. Even when he was talking about dying on the cross, he saw himself drawing all people to himself. In fact, he saw the cross as something that would help to make him instead of something that would break him. He saw the cross as that which could help him to accomplish God's vision for his life instead of that which defeated God's vision for his life. He saw the cross as that which would glorify him instead of that which would disgrace him. He saw the cross as that which would extend his career instead of that which would end his career. He saw the cross as that which would help him to grow instead of that which would reduce or eliminate him. And this was, was truly an amazing perspective when we remember what the cross was. As many know, death by crucifixion was a means of capital punishment designed to disgrace and to torture in addition to ending life. It was worse than lethal injections and gas chambers and hanging on the electric chair, all of which are relatively quick deaths that recognize that even a condemned person has some rights. In contrast, when a person was crucified, that person was stripped naked and exposed to the public. Yeah. Because of our sense of modesty and respect today, whenever we see images or pictures or statues of the crucifixion, Jesus' uh, private parts are always covered with some kind of loincloth, but in reality, people were often not covered at all. It is likely that Jesus was crucified naked, exposed to his friends, his disciples, and his family as well as to cheer to a jeering and a hostile crowd. Mary, his mother, Mary Magdalene, and the other women standing there, the disciples, and whatever followers were in the crowd, saw him. Crucifixion was meant to inflict both shame on the victim and embarrassment on all who knew him. Yes. Crucifixion was also a very slow and painful death. Sometimes it took days for a person to die by being stretched out and lifted up on the cross, naked and exposed as he baked in the hot Palestinian sun. That's why the scripture, in the scriptures, Pilate was so surprised. He was so surprised to learn that Jesus was dead in only three hours. Typically, death was so slow and painful that those persons who were being crucified sometimes went out of their minds as they hung there in their suffering on the cross. As the victims of crucifixion were dying, vultures flew overhead because after death, the bodies of those circled were left to rot on the cross or thrown into the ground to become food for wild dogs and other scavengers. We can, we can understand why the followers of Jesus then were there to take his body down as soon as he died. They knew what happened to the dead bodies of those who were crucified. Jesus knew all that death by crucifixion would entail. He knew the pain, he knew the suffering, the disgrace, and the shame that went with death on the cross. Yet, he could still look at the cross and keep his vision of how big he could become. Yes. And I can almost hear the man in our text today from Mark asking from the realms of eternity, what must I do to be saved? I believe to keep 
Our vision of how big we can become requires at least three things. First, Jesus had to be willing to go against the majority opinion or consensus of his surroundings. He had to be willing to walk alone. Secondly, he had to be willing to make some sacrifices. And thirdly, he had to have unswerving faith in the integrity and the power of God. Sometimes, beloved, to keep the vision of how big we can become, we have to be willing to walk alone. Mm -hmm. Note that I said that Jesus could look at the cross and keep his vision of how big he could become. I did not say that Jesus and his followers could look at the cross and see how big he could still become. For those who surrounded him did not necessarily share Jesus' perception of the cross. To begin with, those who surrounded Jesus did not share his vision of his ministry or his life. The followers of Jesus, for the most part, were still following a traditional understanding of his messiahship. They were still hoping that Jesus would overthrow their Roman oppressors and establish an earthly kingdom. And since they were the Lord's hand-picked disciples, they envisioned themselves being in positions of power when Jesus came into his own. Since their understanding of who Jesus was and what he was about was wrong, they could not share the master's understanding or approach to the cross. Peter gave voice to his objections when the master started talking about dying on the cross, but he was not the only disciple who had problems with the thought of Jesus dying by crucifixion. Some of the disciples had hoped to share in Jesus' success. And if he failed and ended up getting himself crucified, their futures and careers would also be impacted. After all, some of them had left everything to follow Jesus. That is what the disciples reminded Jesus of in this text from Mark this morning. We heard uh, Peter begin to say to him, look, we have left everything and followed you. Sometimes, though, we will be blessed to have persons around us who also see the vision God has given for our lives, even if sometimes others cannot see it. Sometimes we'll be blessed that they will still support us in or pray for us in our work as we work toward that vision. Whatever we have accomplished together in the years that I have been the rector of this church, have been accomplished because there were those who either saw the vision of growth themselves or were willing to support the vision they were told about, even though they did not see it. Yes. However, many times the majority of those in our surroundings will not see what we see. Sometimes the majority of the members of our family or our household, the majority of our friends or colleagues or co-workers or neighbors or fellow church members, will not see what we see. Thus, many times, we will have to go against the majority consensus in our surroundings to hold on to the vision that God has given us. Sometimes, holding on to a vision of bigness will mean that we will have to walk all by ourselves. Yes. Yes. Never lose sight of your vision. No matter your surroundings or what those in your surroundings might say, you know what God showed you. Right. You know the pictures God has painted and the images God has imprinted in your mind. You know the hunger, the thirst, and the restlessness you have for something bigger and something better. You know the thought that keeps nagging you that there has to be more for you than what you have now, than what you presently see and where you are. You know what scriptures spoke to you when you read them or heard them. You know the promises of God that you are standing upon. So no matter what your surroundings say, never lose sight of how big you can become. Yes, yes, yes. Jesus had to make some sacrifices. Much like the sacrifices asked of the man who asked the question in our gospel text today. Good teacher, 
What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go sell what you own and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come. Follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. To keep sight of the vision that God has given us, the vision of bigness, Jesus had to sacrifice the understanding and support of some of his closest friends, family members, and supporters to keep sight of the vision of bigness. He had to sacrifice some short-term comfort for long-term gains. To keep sight of the vision of bigness, he had to sacrifice his life on a hill called Calvary. Yes. And in today's world of instant this and instant that, we got to have it right now. The idea of sacrifice is not very popular. In a world that makes instant millionaires from the lottery, sacrifice is not very popular. In a world of mass marketing that can give a person instant fame and glory, sacrifice is not very popular. In a world of charge it now and pay for it later in easy installments, sacrifice is not very popular. In a world of broken vows, sacrifice is not very popular. In a world where considered to be more important than the right education or the right morals or the right work ethic, sacrifice is not very popular. But I came out here to remind that sacrifice is still a part of the Christian life. Yes. To get some things in life, we are still going to have to make some sacrifices. But what is sacrifice? It is something that costs us something. It is something we give up, even though it means something to us. It is something we cannot part with easily or lightly. What is sacrifice? It is something we think about twice before we give it up. It entails denying ourselves of something because of our love and desire for something else. If it's something we can easily give up without much thought, then it's not a true sacrifice. If we can give it up and then walk away from it without a second thought, it's not a sacrifice. If it's something we do not have to struggle with, pray about it, agonize over before we part with it, I believe it's probably not a sacrifice. If it is something we won't miss, it's not a sacrifice. If after giving it up, we don't feel it in our heads, our hearts, or our pocketbooks, yes. I believe it's probably not a sacrifice. His vision of bigness. Jesus had to make a sacrifice. Before him stood the devil who offered him the kingdoms of the world with all their glory and splendor. Ahead of him stood the cross with all of its suffering and pain. Before him stood the crowd yelling glad hosannas and desiring him to be their king. Ahead of him stood the cross with all its loneliness and all of its shame. Before him stood his friends and supporters with their desires for his ministry as well as their personal hopes of good fortune. But ahead of him stood the cross with its distress and pain for all those who loved him. Jesus looked beyond the temptations and the comfort and support that were in front of him. He looked beyond the death on the cross and saw the vision of a name higher than any other. That God would bestow upon him if he proved faithful. That is, that at his name, every knee would bow and every tongue would confess him as Savior and Lord. So Jesus chose the cross. To the distress of the devil, to the dismay of the crowds, to the disappointment of friends and family, he chose death 
on the cross. He sacrificed present pleasures for future promise. He sacrificed short-term rewards for long-term righteousness and gain. Jesus had to make sacrifices. And here it is. We will too. Michelangelo sacrificed his eyesight as paint dripped in his eyes while he lay on his back to present for the ages the glorious mural in the Sistine Chapel. John Wesley sacrificed his love for books and music and art and architecture to spend most of his time on Saddleback, carrying the gospel and planting the faith everywhere he could. Martin Luther King Jr. sacrificed cushy endowed teaching positions at the leading educational institution in the land. He sacrificed deanships at prestigious seminaries and universities. He sacrificed comfortable pulpits in big steeple churches. He sacrificed time with his family and long life as a man to die as this country's most dynamic social prophet. And yet, years after each of their deaths, right, right. their works, right. their lives, and their names are still held yes. in reverence. It may not be popular to say, love it, but the truth is, you don't get much of anywhere in life. And even if you get there, you don't stay there very long or enjoy it very much without some sacrifice. Jesus still says to us, whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. To keep his vision of bigness, Jesus had to be willing to walk alone. Jesus had to be willing to make some sacrifice. And lastly, I'm going to let you go. He had to have an unswerving faith in the integrity and power of God. Yes. When you are out there seemingly by yourself, when nobody seems to understand and those who do understand are not able to help you, you have to know beyond a shadow of a doubt yes. that God is with you, yes. that God will see you through. When you have made sacrifices and hard choices and have to know, you have to know You are having a Calvary moment and you are stretched out naked and exposed before friends and family and supporters who do not understand. You have to know that God will not disappoint you. That God will bring you through. When you are vulnerable before enemies, you are delighted who are delighting in your struggles, mocking you in your efforts and hoping for your failure. You have to know beyond a shadow of a doubt in whom you have believed and you have to be persuaded that he's able to keep you. He's able to keep The sun drops its fiery head and the locks of its shoulders at high noon and refuses to shine. And the earth underneath begins to rock and to reel like a drunken man. You have to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is still in charge. No matter how bleak or hopeless the situation looks. When death comes creeping in the room and stretches its icy hands upon your career, your reputation, your dreams, your heart, your relationships, your household, your church, and even your family.
sometimes happy and sometimes depressed, sometimes clear-headed and sometimes confused, but go the distance. Sometimes on the mountain and sometimes in the valley, but you got to go the distance. For if you go the distance, God not only goes with you, but God will go before you. God will lead you as a pillar of cloud by day, and God will protect you as a pillar of fire by night. To keep the vision of bigness in view, trust God no matter what. No matter what the grapevine said, trust God. No matter what the economist says, trust God.